into the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of the Innerverse podcast. I'm your host, Chance, and I'm psyched that on this frigid and blizzardy day, I get to partake in yet another enlightening conversation and share it with you all. To begin, we once again invoke the source and singularity of all life to imbue our dialogue with the breath and spirit of the divine creative process and give thanks for the shared existence in which we can together ponder the mysteries of being. In a prior age, our ancestral predecessors did very little without keeping that mathematical order of nature's operations in mind, as the reenactment of cosmic forces was perceived to be the power through which the material necessities of life could be ensured. The performative aspect of mythology and metaphysics may seem lost to the fog of time, but when one sees the archetypal architecture of the monomyth's hyperstitious sense of reverence, a hyperstitious sense of reverence begins to exude from even the most mundane and superficial human affairs, as one's ability to witness the cosmological framework also initiates a quickening of synchronicity between the inner and outer worlds, such that the universal truth becomes increasingly self-evident in all spheres of human affairs, the natural world, and even that which we call artificial. And just how the ancients and prehistoric and thus preliterate societies preserved and transmitted their understanding of the generative powers of reality, as well as how the methods of their wisdom traditions reflected and influenced the psyche of men from chiefly oral cultures. This is the domain and playground of today's learned and honored guest, Dr. John Knight Lundwall. I was first enthusiastically introduced to Dr. Lundwall's research and writing by Interverse regular John McHugh, as they are colleagues and collaborators in the field of Southwestern American archaeoastronomy. But as exciting as their groundbreaking discoveries in the desert may be, we'll have to save a lot of that for a future date, as today we're blessed with an enormous amount to, con to consider via the exploration of Dr. Lundwall's literary magnum opus, Mythos and Cosmos, Mind and Meaning in the Oral Age. As he extrapolates in his book, oral cultures live in nature, literate cultures use it. And while this indeed seems to be the case, if our entire framework of thinking about reality is filtered through the smeared lens of literacy, and to quote him again, much of ancient myth and ritual is permanently buried underneath a long forgotten oral network of ideas wed to an oral way of perceiving the universe. What can we infer from the earliest literary cultures about the foundations upon which their wisdom traditions were transcribed? Most importantly, how can considering the oral tradition expand our imagination of what is possible about life, the universe, and everything? As our technological life expands and our culture's cosmology sits entrenched in a materialist paradigm, it is said that the world is growing smaller. And so today we ask, what does our cosmology have to do with our civilization? In his book, Dr. Lundwall explains that what we think about the universe, its origin and structure, turns out to be the box that contains our imaginations. Longtime listeners know that what we do here on Interverse is liberate your imagination from every conceivable box as we discover their invisible boundaries. And today we return to the primal mentality as human beings who have gone from mythos to logos. Hopefully today we incur that eternal return to the mythos from which it all began and see the place with new eyes. 
I, for one, could not be more stoked to get into it. And as a uh, hybridization of the oral and literate minds, I think the podcast may be a perfect medium to consider these thoughts. So let's unite our intentions to send the warmest welcome to our new guest, the observer of the oral, or, oral origins of man and master of mythological metaphysics, Dr. John Lundwall. Thanks for being here and welcome to the universe. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That was a spectacular introduction. <laughs> Thank you. It got to be a mouthful at times, but uh, it's a spectacular book, man. I'm super excited to have you on. Big thanks to Dr. John McHugh. Oh, John McHugh. He's not a doctorate, right? But in my book, he, he deserves the title. So um, how would you like to introduce yourself, you know, after all of that and, and the work that you've been doing? Uh, sure. Um, first off, I just bleeped out. I, I was telling you, I'm in the middle of a snowstorm, so I'm, I might get a, a few bleeps as we do this. Um, look, I've got my uh, doctorate from Pacifica Graduate School. That's the Joseph Campbell School of Comparative Myth in California. Uh, I teach their adjunct faculty as well. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, actually, um, over the uh, seven, you know, three years of coursework, five years of dissertation writing, so over eight years, you know, when you get a doctorate in comparative myth, what, what you really do is you get a doctorate in comparative myth theory. <laughs> you, yeah. That's not an understatement. Um, and so as I was going through the material, you know, of course, it, it prefers a psychological lens as to how to interpret myth and religion. Uh, but as I was going through all the theoretical models that we studied, I noticed that uh, there was some large lacuna, uh, missing parts. <clears throat> uh, Campbell and Jung uh, do not touch on orality. Um, you know, Harrison and the myth ritual school, Eliade uh, and his approach of the sacred and profane, they do not touch on orality. Uh, and so, uh, actually, there are several large wedges of of anthropological models that uh, seem to have not connected ancient mythology with the epistemology of orality. Uh, and so really, my book is an exploration of how literacy structures thought, how orality structures thought. Uh, as part of that, uh, another missing piece in the uh, theoretical models was oral cosmology. Um, you know, there's a great book that that was published in the 1960s. Uh, actually, two two interesting books published in the 1960s. Uh, one was uh, Stonehenge Decoded by Gerald Hawkins. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, he was a astronomy professor at Boston University, and he had the uh, just simple insight that the stones at Stonehenge lined up to uh, the setting sun on the solstices and equinoxes, depending on where you stood. And so he realized that uh, it was astronomically aligned and sort of formed a, an ancient computer as to how to predict uh, your calendric cycles. And so he published a paper and uh, then wrote a book, uh, 1965 Stonehenge Decoded, and he was immediately uh, eviscerated. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the leading um, archaeologist in Britain, uh, Richard Atkinson, wrote a response to the book, uh, a paper titled uh, Moonshine on Stonehenge, where he said, that we all know that Stonehenge was built by a bunch of howling barbarians. <laughs> and so, so that was the response in the 1960s. And it turns out Gerald Hawkins was right. And it also turns out that uh, uh, Richard Atkinson, uh, you know, admitted that Hawkins was right. And so changed his tune. And, you know, since then... Uh, ancient sites all around the world in every inhabitant continent uh, have been found to have structures or standing stones that have some 
kind very often astronomical alignments. And so clearly these ancient peoples all around the world, different times, different cultures, different languages, they're all watching the sky, which shouldn't surprise us. We, we lost track of that in modernity because we don't see the sky anymore. It's all uh, dissolved under light pollution and everyone does their work in cubicles and libraries and lecture halls and no one goes out and looks up anymore. <laughs> And and if they do, uh, you don't see much because in cities you don't you don't see the Milky Way, you don't see the stars, and so we've we've lost track of that, and uh, that is a huge huge problem for the study of ancient uh, religion, the evolution of human consciousness. It's not just ancient myth. In any case, there's a second book. I don't know. Am I boring? Yeah. There's a second book that I read. Um, you may have heard of it or read it called Hamlet's Mill. Oh, uh, by, yeah. By Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha von. Again, written in the 19, published in the 1960s. Uh, de Santiana was a history of science professor at MIT. Uh, and when he published, uh, you know, MIT wouldn't publish his book. Um and so he had to go to a second tier publisher to get it published. And of course, it has been deconstructed. I mean, everybody gets deconstructed, right? That, that's just part of the deal. Uh, but after reading that, you know, that put myth and cosmology on my radar. And I've traveled a bit around the world with the, my camera looking at ancient sites and the astronomical alignments of ancient sites. And, and clearly, um, De Santian von Decken at least have a fundamental part of the ancient thought world correct in that uh, people were wed to the cycles of the sky. And it's not just agrarian cultures. Um, you know, as an example, the... Uh, Lakota, you know, the indigenous peoples of the of the plains in North America uh, were hunter. There were hunter gatherers. They did grow some um, crops, but it's not full time agriculture. Right. They hunted the buffalo. They followed the food chain. Um, and uh, we learn through the ethnography that all this time, we just thought that these peoples that were hunter gatherers followed the food chain. And that's what, that's how they lived. They would follow the animal herds. They would, you know, where the berries or roots uh, sprouted, they would go there at the appropriate time. They're just following the food chain. Well, you know what, they were doing that. But in the case of the Lakota, um, they would set up winter camp in a specific uh, part of the plains. And then uh, when winter was over, they would break camp and they would move to spring camp. And when spring was over, they'd bring ca break camp and move to summer camp. Well, what they were doing is they were following the sun. The original summer camp. Their, yeah, the original summer camp. Their summer camp was at Devil's Tower in Wyoming. They were following the sun through their constellations. So when the sun entered their winter constellation, they had to be at their winter camp. Their camp represented the constellation. And when the sun moved out of the winter constellation and moved into the spring constellation, they would follow the sun and break camp and create a new camp, which represented their spring constellation. In other words, their hunter-gatherer travels were wed to the cycles of the sun through the stars. So they were following the, the food chain, but they were following a sacred cosmology that had the food chain embedded in it. And the important thing was to follow the sun. So uh, furthermore, their camps represented constellations. They had a sky map on the ground as they migrated. They had a land map in the sky as the stars moved across the sky. So they had this constant reference of this is where we go as, as the stars move through the year. And then as they travel on the land, that's a, it's, a, it's a mirror of heaven. 
So I, this is not uncommon. Uh, hunter-gatherer societies are often pilgrimage societies. We've lost sight of that. They have to be at certain places at certain times of the year to perform certain rituals. Uh, so they're not just, you know, hunting the mastodon out of caves. The, as soon as the sentient Homo sapien shows up in the historical record, the Homo sapien comes with sophisticated metaphysics. And we, you know, we, we tend to reduce them into, you know, just a materialist interpretation. Uh, you know, the first cities, they built walls so that they could protect their gardens. We forget, actually, in the ancient Near Eastern context and in Egypt, you could not build a city until you first built a temple. You had to cosmicize the land. You had to set up an altar to allow the God to come in. And very often those temples, those altars were astronomically aligned. They too were following the sun through the stars. And only then after cosmicizing the land, could you build your city walls? And so, you know, we, we miss this element that we sublimate everything into material needs uh, and we forget that the human being first and foremost has metaphysical needs uh, the anyway. what I'll add to that is <laughs> the uh, literary lens of the modern world have really been moving in that direction since the Greeks the ancient Greeks this lens creates like an abstraction this is where you argue in your book where we are losing track over generations of the spirit behind the myth. The, even the word oral is practically the, practically the same word as aural, the Greco-Latin word referring to wind or breath. This is the Hebrew ruach, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, uh, gust, <laughs> Holy Ghost. You know, this is the, the pneuma, the, the divine wind that's found in the mythology as a technical language, as you put it, akin to scientific jargon. So what is happening when they reenact the movements of the sun and they reenact their mythology, they are reinforcing, teaching the new generation, reinforcing their own understanding of the, the way that life works here on the material domain. And then more importantly, fascinating concept that the reenactment of that myth is the uh, participation in cosmic forces or the ma'at, what I call the math mathematical order of operations in which cr creation or nature operates, right? That participating in that empowers or ensures the survival of the people. And yeah, I'd love to uh, <laughs> love that's, to talk a little bit more about that. That's very good, Chance. Um, that, that is correct. Uh, look, for 99% of human history, people did not have writing. Now, that's just mind blowing because we just think, you know, we, we think literate thoughts and we forget this is brand new. <laughs> um, when you don't have writing, first off, there's a per permanent epistemological wall between literacy and orality. Much of the ancient oral world is lost to us. You know, I, we read mythological texts, but they weren't texts. They were songs. They were dances. They were chants. They were rituals. They were festivals. Um, that's what they were. And when you take that and you turn it into a text, what do you lose? <laughs> well, you lose all the context. <laughs> and so uh, th that means it's extraordinarily difficult to interpret mythological material out of that context. Um. You know, we have the Pyramid of Unis in Egypt. This is the, the pyramid where the first pyramid texts appear. This is the largest uh, religious corpus of texts that, um, that exist in the ancient world. There they are, 23, 2400 BCE, uh, appearing as if out of nowhere. Well, what are they? Well, first off, they're not texts. The texts represent 
rituals, cosmological and mythological scenarios. This is the oral world that the text is recording. A lot of scholars from diverse backgrounds assume that as soon as writing is invented, people start thinking literate thoughts. But that is not the case. It takes 3,000 years after the invention of writing to really develop a literate consciousness where you're thinking in text. Um, before that, you're not thinking in text. You're thinking with the divine word, the song, the chant, the sun moving through the stars in the sky, the, the ritual cycle. That's how, uh, again, oral peoples, your primary referent of meaning is what you see in nature. It's not a text. Literate peoples, your primary referent is what you're reading. You could argue we actually now live in post-literacy because no one reads anymore. Everyone's texting and TikToking and <laughs> emojiing, <laughs> emojiing. Right, right. I want to say, too, to what you just pointed out, like in my own subjective experience, how I've come to delineate what is my own thinking mind and then something akin to like a psychic intuition is that in the latter, I will have a spontaneous mental arising of imagery like it happens all the time around the house i'll just be doing something and then i'll see my mind's eye my wife doing some action and then moments later i my wife then initiates that action and i like just saw it in my mind's eye as opposed to the normal stream of thoughts that come through is like you know in words in text as you said so i th i think that there's something to that that the <laughs> the difference between the spirit of the act itself the the motion and the flow of it which is what orality really encompasses the performative nature of of uh of our existence versus the abstract which is the word the symbolic the representative oh well, that's uh, it's very good i mean look uh because all of evolution occurred without writing um Oral structures are permanently in our psyche and consciousness. Um, those will transform, but they'll never go away. Uh, and uh, your example, I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, how do you explain uh, imaginal insights, deja vu? Um, well, it's more than that. It's... Um, <laughs> You know, the birth of Western rationalism, according to our historians of science, begins 600 BCE with the first Greek schools, Pythagoras, Parmenides. Uh, we only have one scrap of writing from Parmenides, and it's uh, his imaginal voyage through the stars. <laughs> this is this is the birth, birth of Western rationalism, the separation from the ancient mythological world. And uh, Parmenides declares his authority to teach in the Western academic school by um, uh, describing his imaginal journey through the heavens. Uh, you know, that is really interesting. And of course, Pythagoras isn't far off either. So, you know, in any case, uh, sure enough, when um, your primary referent of meaning is that which you observe, uh, then a, a couple of things result automatically out of orality. Uh, you, you have no writing to record anything. So any information you need to pass down, uh, it, it, your important information has to be passed down in memorable form. And so to do that, you then repeat the information you pass down in different mediums, right? You're going to sing your memories that need to be passed down. You're going to dance. That's a different medium, Right. Ritual is a there's a oral narrative, which is myth. You, you'll tell a story. First and foremost, we are storytellers. We're autonomous creators of narratives. Human beings uh, did that in order to survive. That, this is how we separated ourselves from the other animal species. We tell stories. So that's oral narrative. But we've got to tell in oral societies, you have to tell that narrative, the myth in as many different ways as possible. 
So you dance the myth. That's somatic narrative. You ritualize the myth. You do that in conjunction with a rising sun or star, heliacal rising or setting, or the, the phase of the moon. You're doing it in conjunction with celestial phases very often. Um, and so, you know, that's a uh, celestial narrative. So you, 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 we forget that mo a lot of myths could are not campfire stories. You couldn't just sit down and tell a sacred narrative. You had to tell the myth in the right place at the right time. Um, in, in the Mayan world, <clears throat> They they operated their uh, society at a place to see. This is uh, the Popol Vuh, which is the creation text of the Maya that survives. Uh, and it begins, I mean, it's, it's written in the 16th century after they're being colonized and they've lost their sacred space from which they told their myths and did their dances and observed the cosmos. Uh, but the... the, the the Pobol Vuh means council book. And what it was, was a woven mat where the astronomical priests sat and observed the cosmos and told their creation story. And what was their creation story? It was how the world worked. Um, when the Big Dipper was high in the sky, that began the agricultural season. When uh, the Pleiades set on the horizon, uh, that's when you planted your seeds. Right. And so they would look at all these celestial correspondences, dance. Every one of those things were personified into a divine aspect. Orality produces polytheism. Polytheism is a direct result of your primary me uh, metaphor of meaning being nature. Uh, in order to pass down everything you need to pass down, look, if you're a hunter gatherer and and the herds migrate into this at a particular time, you've got to be in that valley when the sun rises on that part of the horizon as viewed from this spot, right? So the herd, the valley, the star that rises before the sun, the sun and where you're watching, all that gets personified. That becomes a deity, that becomes a deity, that becomes a deity. You tell a story and you weave the deities together so that as you recount the story, you know exactly where to be, when to be, to hunt your herd. Does that make sense? So orality is, produces polytheism. Monotheism is a product of literacy. It, it is, in, you know, besides Akhenaten, uh, oral societies are either polytheistic or henotheistic. Uh, and that's part of the oral network of encoding information and passing it down. You have to personify every different aspect of what you need to pass down. And this becomes your pantheon. You say, uh, Myth is the technical language of the oral age. Deities and pantheons are very often technical terms. You know, we think of them as people or, you know, male gods, female gods, they're copulating all the time, and especially the male gods. And, and so we think that they're just sort of oversexed, super divine light people. <laughs> yeah, uh, like uh, Marvel Comics superheroes yes, or something. Marvel, that's right. <laughs> um, well, in the oral world, uh, the names of deities are technical terms. Is that very often, it's easier to think of them as verbs instead of nouns. Uh, you know, you that said is so. That is, you just summed up the difference between orality and literacy in a word: the verb versus the noun. A verb, an action, it's it's real. <laughs> A noun is conceptual. You know, there's no such thing as a person, place, or thing. They're, those are symbolic overlays by which we refer to something real. But that something that is real is actually a verb. Like, 
you know, a, a human being, being is a verb. We're in a constant process that's unfolding and in motion, vibrating, moving. It's not like a, a static, permanent thing the way that a noun label works. And honestly, wrapping your head around that particular <laughs> dichotomy is uh, going to be revealing to all kinds of areas of life. Where is uh, the emphasis on what is real and what is living, at, aka motion, verb, versus what is artificial and therefore like dead and uh, stagnant in a sense. And that's a big difference between orality and literacy. If you were to like boil it down, <laughs> that, that that's uh, that's profound. Uh, that was a good summation. Um, yeah. So here we go back. Uh, I, I'm coming full circle uh, back to the Pyramid of Unis, the Pyramid text. Uh, as you go down the shaft into the, there are three chambers in the Pyramid of Unas, and the first texts appear right before the first chamber called the antechamber. It's right in the hallway when the first texts appear. Egyptologists, by the way, disagree on practically everything. Some believe that the first texts you encounter in that hallway shaft are the first texts that you're supposed to read. Other Egyptologists say, oh, no, they're the last text you're supposed to read. In other words, the true entrance to the pyramid is the sarcophagus, which is in the Western chamber. And you go through the chambers and exit out the entry passageway. The entry passageway becomes a birth canal for the soul of the Pharaoh to ascend to the northern sky. So that means the first text you encounter as you enter the pyramid might be the last text of the series of texts, right? But we don't know. So um, uh, what we do know is if you translate the text literally, a glyph to word translation, they're just complete gibberish. Right. It, uh, it says, open the sky door. There is the baboon's penis. Uh, the baboon's penis uh, essentially leads you to the path where the gods scoop water. S say this utterance, and then there's some ritual incantations to say. And then uh, it ends with the baboon's anus. <laughs> 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 I was following until you got to that part. I was like, okay, baboon's <laughs> penis, that's Thoth. The penis might be the Herm, like the Herm stone, you know, the water scooping, maybe the Milky Way, perhaps pointing us to like a world axis description, but I'm lost on the, the baboon's anus. I don't know. Well, I. Yeah, I keep bleep, bleeping in and out. Uh, Again, it's not too bad. What we are looking at are uh, ritual, cosmological, and mythological scenarios. These are all things that you dance, sing, chant, and do. So uh, the baboon's penis, actually, so someone like uh, Susan Morrow uh, translates the baboon's penis as the sword of Orion. So the sky door is Orion which sits at, uh, you know, where the ecliptic crosses the Milky Way. You've got Taurus, Gemini, Orion, all in that spot in the sky. And these stars actually tend to be in almost every cosmology, in almost every indigenous culture around the world, in part because they're invariant. That Where the ecliptic, is, which is the path of the planets, right, it all, all follows one line in the sky where the ecliptic crosses the Milky Way that never changes. And that's on one side of the sky. That's Taurus Gemini with Orion underneath. Orion's in the underworld. He's below the ecliptic at the merging point where the ecliptic enters the Milky Way. The Milky Way is that path to the divine world. And so here is a nexus. And it's seen that way in many different cultures. It's really quite astonishing. And what, what that tells you is that, again, your primary reference is what you see in nature. And in a pure dark sky, you know, the Milky Way is a revelation. It's this big river of light. And, of course, to the naked eye observer, it's in grayscale, though sometimes you can see some greens, maybe a little brown, browns in it. Um, 
But uh, the Sword of Orion is where the Orion Nebula, Nebula is, which you can see with the naked eye, a big patch of green in dark skies. And so uh, they're watching. They're watching these luminaries, the, the visible planets, move across this line and emerge in and out of the Milky Way. Uh, Humans always been just watching uh, dramas unfold on a black screen <laughs> one way <Yeah>. or the other. <laughs> well, the sky is the original television set, right? Uh, the sky is the first printing press. Uh, and of course, that's using a literate metaphor for an oral category. So that isn't actually, you know, that has problems. But uh, when you wed... Um, you know, I, I sent you a graphic of the oral and printing press. Um, you know, look, if, if there you go, if uh, if you want to be at a specific place uh, at a specific time to hunt your herds or you need to grow maize or wheat or barley um, and you know, you have to plant it at a specific season. If you plant it too early, your crop's going to fail. If you plant it too late, your crop's going to fail. You got to be in the sweet spot, right? So whether you're agriculturist or a hunter-gatherer, uh, the correct time to do things is ubiquitous and mandatory. So what you, the first thing oral peoples do is they observe nature. There are two parts to nature, the ground and the sky. A lot of scholarship has forgotten that latter part. But the sky and the earth are always wed together. In fact, uh, the Mayan word for world literally means sky earth. When you, when you say the world, uh, uh, you, you are referencing both the sky and the earth. And they inter relate them. So, uh, you know, when the sun rises in that constellation, it's time to plant. When the star's in that position, it's time to harvest. It's time to germinate. It's time to, <clears throat> it's not just agricultural and hunting. Um, time to go to war. Time to go to trade. Uh, best time to canoe. Best time to sail. Uh, right? What, however, whatever your life ways are, whether you're on a coast uh, or, or on a river, uh, planting crops, following herds, uh, whatever your life ways are, they maximize the survivability of that life way by observing. You know, the rain comes in at this time, the sun's in this position, the star's in that position. I am now going to do a ritual. Is going to occur when all these elements come into play. And my ritual is going to. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so. Oral peoples think analogically. Now, sometimes uh, because they're so intimately wed to the observations of nature, there is a beauty to it. But sometimes it's not beautiful. Right. Uh, so uh, as an example. In the world of Mesoamerica, um, the Maya would often offer a human head to start their agricultural cycle, right? Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice is also pretty ubiquitous in ancient cultures, both the old and new world. W why would they do that? Why would you take a human head? Well, um, <clears throat> the head or the scalp was in one way associated with rainmaking. Now, why was it associated with rainmaking? Uh, when a woman gives birth, the first thing that happens is her water breaks. And the first thing that appears out of the womb is what? The head. And the head turns out to have all the divine functions within it. It's where we see, smell, hear, taste, but also speak, which means we project our will through speech, 
So all the divine functions are in the head. So, and the head is produced by water. The woman breaks. And as soon as the baby's born, most of the time, the baby starts crying and produces water, tears out of the eyes. So the head is produced by water. It produces water and it has all the divine functions. So now. Imbibes water too. <laughs> it drinks all, all water. Stuff that's there. right. And then in the Zodiac man, that point in the year where you might start to plant Aries, that's the head. Huh? If you all the uh, zodiacal 12 signs have a correspondence to parts of the body, and that's where the spring equinox is the head. Hey, that's interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, well, so so the bottom line is, if I am going to maximize my ability to grow maize, and of course, maize itself was personified. You, you have a cob of maize that has silk coming out of the top. Well, that was analogized as hair. When you take a cob off the stalk, that's taking a head, right? And the head brings water, which grows your maize. And the water is absolutely essential. So you have these rain-making ceremonies. It's more complicated than that because it's tied in with the Venus cycle. It's tied in with the sun. And it's tied with human sacrifice and head taking. This comes up in the American Southwest. Scalps and heads are, are also being used for rainmaking ceremonies. Uh, but they're thinking analogically. They're, they're doing this. They're, they're observing nature. And they say, look, uh, when Venus sets as the evening star in the north, that begins our rain cycle. So that is the deity that brings the rains. Now, how do I propitiate that deity and ask that deity for a great rain year to get grow my crops? I need to offer it something. I'm going to offer it what produces rain and is produced by rain ahead. So you, you perform a ceremony, you offer a sacrifice. In this case, it's human sacrifice. But as you look over the world, um, this is happening in a huge variety of different ways. So when we go back to that pyramid text, we're, we don't have head taking, but what we have is these direct analogical metaphors that are things they are observing, right? It's, it's not a noun, it's a verb. They're observing a, a series of scenarios which they have ritualized. And they have, how, how do I get reborn as an eternal ak, as as the ba and the ka, as the eternal soul in the in the sky, well, I can see every year the agricultural cycle. Things are born, things live, things die, and the next year they are reborn. I perform certain rituals to keep that going. Now, if I transfer those rituals over to the human world, I can therefore maximize my ability to be reborn does that make sense it does there's uh, an interesting similarity to what you're talking about where in the middle ages the templars allegedly had a ritual involving some kind of mystical head of saint john the baptist that they used uh potentially even had some sort of like communication come through it according to the text, but specifically their ritual with this head was to invoke the fecundity of nature to bestow, you know, success upon their agricultural ventures. So that's a different time, entirely different continent. And yet there's some kind of si like similarity to the analogy between the head and the fecundity ritual. Very interesting. It's actually quite ubiquitous. Um, and that's because Everybody who is observing nature will observe the same patterns, right? The head's always produced by the, the water breaking. Uh, the, the human being only produces clear liquid through tears, uh, which comes out of the head. And the head is the seat of all the divine functions. Uh, this is in every oral culture. This is obvious. And so... Um, you know, we get in the second millennium BCE, 
in Peru, the uh, sprouting head motif, which is a head with vines coming out of it, which brings the fecundity to the agricultural cycle. That, that, that occurs in South America, Central America, North America. It occurs in Europe, in China, in uh, Africa, you know, in wherever agriculture is established, there often in the ancient world, very often some form of uh, sacrifice is utilized and, and actually very often uh, it's human sacrifice that can be utilized. You know, different cultures do it in different ways. Uh, you know, Mesoamerica, the human sacrifice was quite prolific and, and filled with pageantry. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you, you only offer to head once every eight years, right, uh, with uh, a celestial cycle, right? It's part of keeping the cosmos going. Or sometimes you didn't offer a head at all, right? Uh, so there are other ways to ad administer sacrifice. But the head is very often in multiple cultures over thousands of years associated with the fecundity you were talking about. So that's that, fascinating. That, go, yeah. go ahead. Oh, that just goes to show that certain um, similarities in ancient mythologies, you know, for the longest time, especially in the 19th century, it, people believed that it was dispersion. And, you know, actually in the 19th century, the European anthropologists all believed that it all came from Noah. Right. No, it was the, you know, the, the only surviving human family after the flood. And so uh, then all these similarities they began finding in all these traditions and myths, they they said it all came from one source uh, in dispersionary theory. Well, you know, obviously that's not correct. And so now uh, we but can look. But there is the interesting thing of all, all kinds of cultures worldwide having a type of Noah doesn't mean that that was literally a true story, but maybe there is a dispersion more of like a commercial sort, seafarers, something like that, rather than there actually being you know, a bottleneck where, because <laughs> mystically Noah is a reincarnated Adam, right? It's just the uh, the anthro anthropos cosmos or whatever, the, you know, the Adam Cadmon. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, we could do a show chance on uh, the, the flood myth. Um, I'm down. I, I've done I one have, with John before. I have a uh, chapter in my book on Gilgamesh where I go over uh, certain parts of the flood that are really interesting. Uh, yeah, I no, ask that's, you that's, a specific question, though, at this point. Yeah. I think this would be a good time for it in the like the the show and this this might be a little too out there or maybe you don't have a, a forethought answer for this, but speaking of 19th century r religious mythological scholarship, right? I, I found this idea in the work of Sir Godfrey Higgins, his humongous home, Anacalypsis, giant syncretism, dispersion research, language research, fascinating stuff in there. But he has this idea that uh, perhaps the, the lack of uh, history in oral cultures uh, or even literate cultures for a time up until Herodotus, ostensibly, it had to do with a belief in the repeating cycle in a macrocosmic sense of nature, that all you had to recall was the order that this cycle happened and the length of time across which it occurred, because everything on the earth would in some way either 100% the same or in a thematic similarity repeat over again in the the length of that cycle would was debated or you know different expressions of it in different cultures but what do you think of that possibility that part of the reason for a lack of history prior to herodotus is because of a philosophical belief that there was a repeating cycle and that everything would come back around in a similar or exactly the same way and so it was not really relevant to transcribe every detail of every event the way that modern and literate cultures do. Uh, Higgins apparently is tripping over the category of orality. Again, 99% of human history is no writing. How do you keep a history without writing? Right. Modern r r histories are filled with 
sources and notes and journals and -and so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. Herodotus, you know, 5th century BCE, father of history, he actually doesn't cite another text. He goes out and says, you know, reports on what people tell him, right? So then he starts collecting uh, sort of these, so-and-so said this about this, so-and-so said this. So this is our first historical narrative. We don't get uh, a writer citing another text writing a history until the late 4th century BCE in Greece. Um, but in order to do that, you need texts, you need multiple texts that you can read, right? Again, 99% of human history cultures, oral societies do not keep modern histories. It's impossible. So do they not think historically? Well, they are concerned with history, but their history has to be memorable, And what you remember are archetypes of eternal return, right? You know, in in this case, Eliade is correct. Um, You you remember, you want to remember the most important thing of your culture. So let me give you an example about uh, the voodoo culture, the Caribbean. Uh, the, the, this is our origin of the zombie, right? So um, <clears throat> the Caribbean culture is a synthesis of three different <clears throat> cultures, the indigenous people who live there. Then <clears throat> there was an African diaspora. The African slaves were imported into the Caribbean islands and then they intermarry with the indigenous people. And, you know, their traditions are wed as well. And of course, then there's the Christian colonists. Uh, And so you get indigenous tradition, African tradition, and Christian tradition, all making this voodoo and religion. Well, in the, in the early days, right, they had uh, an ancestor. Um, They would bring up the ancestors from the underworld, right? And the ancestors could animate the, the, the priest or the shaman who is doing this. And this is the origin of our zombie. Uh, you bringing up the dead and reanimating it. Of course, you know, they weren't doing the walking dead zombie. <laughs> what we've done to it is commercialize it like, you know, good modern w- Western people do. Um, well, look, if you want it, so there are spirits coming up from the underworld and the divine spirits are called Loa. They're the deities that bring archetypal powers into the community, into the village. They bring the rain. They bring the sun. They bring, right? Also, um, you do want to remember important people of the village. Like the founder of the village is important to remember. And so you'll do a ritual and recall his spirit from the underworld, right? But it comes in conjunction with the loa in a ritual, And over time, what happens is it's the Loa, the divine person, expands and incorporates what the historical person actually did. The Loa now becomes the founder of the village. And over time, the historical person gets forgotten. Right? Because you can't memorize a phone book uh, in an oral culture. You can memorize archetypal personified deities in ritual cycles. So historical data often gets transferred from the historical to the archetypal in cyclical rituals. So yes, the history gets cyclicized uh, because that is how you are, you're keeping track of your culture. So, you know, this is, uh, uh, it's uh, Alan Dundays, the uh, American folklorist, who notes that almost worldwide, the flood stories are always told in conjunction with the creation stories. And you mentioned that Noah is really just the new Adam. Well, it turns out the biblical flood story is a recitation of the biblical creation story. It's almost, it's a mirror image. The two stories are mirror images of each other. 
uh, you know, you, the waters above and the waters below uh, separate. The first dry land appears. The spirit broods upon the waters. The, the, the grass grows. The animals come. Adam and Eve, God dwells within his temple. That's the creation narrative. You go to the Noah narrative and what happens? The waters above and the waters below, co they don't separate. They commingle. They come back together. Rain is produced, floods the earth. Um, you know, the Noah dove is the serpent in this that? instance. The dove of the flood myth is the serpent of the Eden myth, yeah, I would well, say. Because well, you Noah see the dove on crosses in iconography all the time. And <laughs> that's also what sort of insta instigates the transition into the new world is the dove returns so it's a well, type right. of the eros or the, the 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 savior just as the serpent goes up on the brazen is the brazen serpent goes up on the pole representing the uh, the transition into salvation or you know life being preserved i think that th this isn't a part of the analogy principle and the necessity of linguistic plurality in oral traditions that you talk about that <laughs> multivalent nature of these symbols that once you kind of can wrap your head around that and build out your your archive of possible meanings attributed to one symbol then you can look at a story like the flood myth and the creation story and see exactly as you're saying oh this is the same story beat for beat yeah oh that's right so, right, and Noah sends out a bird that broods upon the waters. It brings back a sign that the first dry land has appeared. He releases all living things on that dry land and builds an altar and thanks God, which is, a, you know, homologous to the Yahweh dwelling in his temple. So it is a repetition, beat for beat. Well, as you go through flood stories, they're very often, uh, tightly associated with the creation stories of their respective cultures because what is being described is the universal nature of nature. Nature is born, lives, and dies, and then repeats. You have birth and you have death. The flood is cosmic death. The creation is cosmic birth. The flood is cosmic death. You tell these stories because that is reality. Right. These story. if you encounter a myth in an oral society, the myth represents ultimate reality. We think it's gibberish. We think it's fake. We think it's false. It's not historical. It's fable, folklore, fantasy. No, in ancient societies, myth was ultimate reality. And they're describing what they're seeing, which is reality. <laughs> we because we think in nouns and they think in verbs, we. Uh, we miss the translation. Well, we're at a good point to maybe uh, close the first hour in a few minutes, but there's plenty of time for you to tell people more about the type of things they might discover in your book and any other work or things that they can connect with online to get more of your perspective. Well, actually, I think this conversation has been a bit heady. Uh, well, that's it, how we do it. This is, the, <laughs> this is not the uh, 101 class. You're talking to the, uh, the self-initiated. This is not the 101 class. Not, no, sir. Um, look, uh, my book, Mythos and Cosmos, uh, goes over how we conceive of history, uh, the, emer you know, the emergence of literacy out of orality, oral cosmology. We... And, you know, the, the rituals that are embedded in all that, yeah, that all sounds a bit heady. Um, I, I try to write it so that it's not too academic, that most people can, can read it. The last I don't know, John, I had to look up a couple of words, <laughs> and I read a lot. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really well written. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, uh, you know, there there is a vocabulary that's uh, necessary, but... Uh, uh, the, the last half of the book is, you know, I just apply the first anthropological models uh, of the first half to actual myth traditions, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the labors of Heracles, and uh, some Old Testament stories out of Genesis. And so you get some real life application of, of the material. And through that, there are some really interesting um discoveries uh you know one of the you know speaking of the flood myth 
I, in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I just as a little tidbit, uh, we get a flood story in the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you remember, Gilgamesh wants to resurrect his uh, friend in Kidu, right? And in Kidu's dead, he's in the underworld. And no, no mortals ever been resurrected out of the underworld except one, Utnapishti, who lives in the underworld. So I don't know what kind of deal that is. He comes back to life, but he stay. He lives in the underworld. So Gilgamesh has to go to to the underworld to find Utnapishti to ask Utnapishti, "How can I bring Enkidu back to life?" So he does that. He faces Utnapishti. Utnapishti says, "Oh." I'll tell you the secret of the gods. I will tell you how to do this. And then Utnapish team tells the flood story. Okay. Now that makes no sense. Like much of ancient myth, it's kind of baboons, penis, baboons, anus. What, what am I reading here? Right. And in fact, almost all scholars have said that the insertion of the flood narrative in the Epic of Gilgamesh is exactly that that wasn't the correct answer that's lost they had this flood story and they needed to put it somewhere so hey we're just going to insert it right here that's the modern academic uh, explanation of that motif in the epic of gilgamesh pretty shaky uh and so what i did is i just said what if that's the correct answer right now i didn't know how to answer that i i had a, a post-it note next to my computer and i had lots of post-it notes of questions i was working on and one of them was what if Utna pish team's answer is the correct one and then one day i was reading the uh pyramid text as one does on a weekend and uh i came across chapter actually it was the book of the dead a papyrus of a knee chapter 175 faulkner's translation and uh, this spell is entitled A Spell of Resurrection, How One Comes Back to Life, right? Well, that's exactly what Gilgamesh is doing with Enkidu. And what do we read? We read that Ani descends into the underworld and encounters a great flood. <laughs> and when I read that, I was like, well, Here's a funerary text about resurrection, and it's recounting a flood story in the ritual cycle. So that told me that, I, in fact, at least by, you know, the early, well, so Papyrus of Ani, if that translation you go by, that's, you know, 15th, 14th century BCE. So the middle of the second millennium BCE, the flood story had been adapted to a resurrection cycle. But again, this is what they do. This is what oral peoples do. They they take some something happening in nature, they ritualize it, and then they transfer it to human culture, right? And if they can do that with the agricultural cycle, they can... That's what they did with the pyramid text. So this is what the so the flood story becomes a metaphor to be reborn. The flood being cosmic rebirth. Well, now if I ritualize the flood, it is individual rebirth into the cosmos. Anyway, I have a whole section on that where I explore that theme. Well, the the sun going through the winter signs of the zodiac is also going through the flood waters as well before it's reborn in spring. Right. So in on many levels, there's <laughs> it all fits together when you have those clues. Yeah. You read a lot of uh, flood narratives around the world and it's all about rebirth, that the flood is the birth after death of the world. So, <laughs> I mean, it actually makes perfect mythological sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to making sense of some more stuff in the second part. Thanks for being here, Dr. Lundwall. Had a great time. And uh, everybody, please, if you're interested in these topics, I don't think you'll find a book on orality quite like Dr. Lundwall's. I mean, I've never really even given much thought to the subject. As you pointed out, <laughs> even Godfrey Higgins was baffled and stumbled upon the notion as he tried to figure out where was history before history? So looking forward to part two. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, 
man, you guys, how'd you like that one? I'm so excited that we have gone past the Lund wall <laughs> and I think added another really high quality regular to our guest list because after that, I mean, it's a fraction of the gravy that is in his book. And, and I'm sure that there's a lot more that he could speak on that's not in the book. To be frank with you, I only read half of it before we had this conversation. That was all I could do because I, I, I there's so much density of, of good stuff in there that I knew I couldn't try to cram more in my head. I would lose, <laughs> I would lose something. So hopefully we'll do multiple shows with Dr. Lundwall. I really like him and his, you know, his personality is fun. Had a great time. Do pick up his book show <laughs> because he was like, you must have a rarefied audience to <laughs> with that first hour. And it seemed like maybe he was a little incredulous to the possibility that there would even be an audience for that level of sophistication and a mythological conversation. So my point being show them, <laughs> show, show him that you exist, you know, go, go give his book sales a little spike. And not just to be showing support, which is great, but also because that's going to be an excellent resource in your library. There's not a lot of people even talking about the oral tradition versus the literary tradition and what that conversation and that lens reveals about our ancestors and more importantly about ourselves today. It's invaluable. I'm going to be referring to this forever. I'm really into it. I feel like this conversation was a, is going to be part of the universe canon of eternally beneficial philosophical conversations, no doubt. So hope you guys feel the same way. <laughs> I'm pretty jazzed up after that. Dang. One of the things I really liked about it was the uh, in the book was how he articulates the analogy principle of oral cultures, like, you know, correspondences. This is basically the infancy, not infancy, like the <laughs> the entire lifespan of of the occult tradition is in orality and our literary version. The correspondences that we consider in like Western occultism is more like the last couple of years of life of a very, very old organism. Fascinating. So that linguistic plurality, uh, you know, it started it, it kind of shifted my opinion a little bit about and I, I'm jury is still out, but you know, the, the legitimacy of things like the hieroglyph translations, cuneiform translations, I will entertain the legitimacy of that stuff, but it's always seemed like a huge problem to me that there could be so many meanings attached to one symbol, to one logogram in the cuneiform sense that a hieroglyphic symbol could be read phonetically, symbolically, in three different other ways, all simultaneously. To me, it seemed like maybe that was just... <laughs> <laughs> the hidden hand creating uh, the the narrative they wanted out of something and in such a way where anything could be said out of anything. And the truth is, you know, that that problem does kind of emerge out of literary uh, analysis or philosophy rather than oral. And so all that stuff is things that you'll get a deeper consideration of if you read the book. I do recommend it once again. <laughs> um but we got to talk about the plus extension before I go on. You may or may not know the drill, but if you want to get the second half of this excellent podcast, all you got to do is sign up over at Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N dot com slash interverse. That'll get you access to not just my content, but the entire plethora of independent creators and their, uh, <laughs> I won't say it's all good, to be honest, but my stuff's good, you know, uh, and you're, you're joining a really true independent network, which is awesome and really supports the creators. I'll tell you, Rockfin has paid me out and supported my life uh, tenfold more than YouTube in one tenth of the time of being on it. So appreciate them for that. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely about it. Now, you could also join on Patreon, which is only five bucks a month, a much cheaper option. One third the cost of Rockfin. You're only getting my stuff. Uh, but you do get the entire archive of my podcasts even beyond and before I was on Rockfin. Well, Rockfin's probably got everything you want, though. The upside of the Rockfin subscription is you'll be there for live streams or premieres of content that goes into the premium side. I can't do that on Patreon currently. So if you like the the party room, that's a good, a good option. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, the plus extension this time around, we talked a lot about the idea of religion as a category applied by a literate mind that doesn't really fit oral the oral tradition or oral mythology. And what is religion? <laughs> that definition is so wide and, and vast. And anyway, it's really deep and maybe contains some unpopular opinions. And I like that section. We talked about the consequence of Christianity being the first religion to start with literacy. Uh, <laughs> I brought up the religion of public health and its mandated rituals. And then we moved on past that conversation, although there's so much to it, into Genesis, the uh, spiritual inheritance of humanity that comes out of cosmogonies, cosmological stories. Uh, then probably some of the best info you've heard and an unsung hero, uh, Camilo, the Renaissance prodigy who had a form of memory palace or memory theater that gave him an encyclopedic level of recall. And we just discussed in, in detail our untapped potential for what he would call, John would call horizontal knowledge, storage and access, including a fascinating story about a Siberian anthropologist meeting a tribal memory keeper and what was possible for that memory keeper that baffles the mind of those of us who store our knowledge in external sources. We then, we then discussed the positive correlative relationship between light pollution and the rise and increase of literacy and then we tried to talk about how we might, how it might look to marry the best of both the oral and literary mind someday, you know, to, to learn from our mistakes, essentially. There's so much to it. Uh, I couldn't agree more about his thesis that mythology is a technical language akin to scientific jargon. You really can't understand what you're looking at until you have that framework. I appreciate that very much. Do, uh, so I do hope you get into the plus extension. I'd like to have him on a vibrant someday to talk with Mario about world axis symbolism. You know, he might not like the take that uh, Mario and I aren't exactly on a heliocentric universe. Uh, I don't live in a model, so I don't have a model, but um, uh, that means I'm not in the model either, the, the popular model. Also was uh, something that popped into my mind when he started discussing voodoo in the first hour. And I never thought about it before, but like that ancestor magic element of voodoo, it really rings parallel to a lot of uh, old Buddhist magic. And I can't help but think about it philologically that that letter V is a, a <laughs> philological match. You know, it's a letter swap you can do with the letter B. So is voodoo some kind of African uh, descendant of voodoo, <laughs> Buddha? I don't know, but when you look into the etymology of the word voodoo, it does seem to have to do with like a, a word for a deity. So it's Buddha. I think it's there, you know, maybe not a, maybe that's not hard and fast evidence, but it's definitely a strike for some kind of dispersion of a proto Buddhism through and by who knows, but interesting nonetheless. Also, I got to say, thank you everybody for hanging in there through the blips it is a blizzard here and in Utah today, I guess. And I was impressed with Dr. Lundwall. He got really good at timing his his speech to the blips. He was paying a lot of attention. Pretty good, pretty good stuff. <laughs> I've definitely had way worse to contend with. This one won't even require editing, but thanks for hanging in there for that little technical glitch of the, the internet blips. Um, and you know, I guess in closing, I think what is important for us to consider is how regardless of our worldview or what philosophy we consider true, there's something universal and eternal about this oral cosmology that not even materialist reductive science can escape. When you get down to it, the philosophical ground of whatever belief system you adopt, it keeps coming back to these ex nihilo ideas, this fiat lux that even the big bang, the explosion of all matter from a, a singularity or a hyper dense atom is, <laughs> I mean, that's the egg of Brahm. You know, that's funny. Fanny is jumping out of the cosmic egg. That's Mithras being born from the, the rock in the cave. It's all the same thing. It's just a matter of what clothes you put on it. What, what, uh, you know, aesthetic you give it materialist or, or mythological allegorical. It's all the same thing. I don't see any difference. It, <laughs> So 
the eternal question remains unanswered. <laughs> Why do we got something instead of nothing? I'm going to keep wondering about it. I hope you guys too, uh, do too. And I hope you loved this episode and want to show some support. There's other ways to support the podcast. I think the best one is to get the plus extension. But on top of that, you guys can do your supplement shopping from Clive to Carl with the link in my show notes or in my opinion, better yet, get yourself some herbal medicines from tippecanoeherbs.com using the Interverse coupon code. There's the Spirit World book series that I've done audio recordings for. An excellent way to support both me and Dylan Sicosio and yourself with your own knowledge, edification. Get yourself an audio book. And last but certainly not least, in fact, probably greatest, is that you can get a biofield tuning with me and we can dig into the uh, informational archive that is your auric field, that divine wind that is whooshing around you invisibly and containing the memory of everything you've experienced and sometimes holding that memory in uh, uh, disadvantageous beliefs that limit your potential and the expression of what life can be in the positive. So if you're interested in that, I do have, I tend to run about four to five, sometimes six weeks out with bookings. If it's, a, if you want to have that, you know, if you want to have that energy field tuned up at least once before springtime, you might want to consider hitting me up. Chance at interversepodcast.com. There's a link to that in the show notes of every episode as well. Or just go to interversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing. And you can find out more about the biofield tuning process. It is changing lives. I don't say that to, just to like toot my own horn. There's other practitioners. They can also do that. Uh, but, you know, if you like me, support me and work with me, you get to meet me. We have a good time. Those tunings are are legit amazing. <laughs> I could go on, but I won't. I'm going to wrap it up. We've had a good time today. I'm glad you guys are here for the ride. Thanks for being Interverse listeners. Thanks for being in that rarefied crowd of people interested and able to keep up. Uh, even if you felt like you couldn't keep up, you know, just keep at it. Keep listening. The, the pieces will fall into place. That's just how it is. We're all like that at first that... Uh, things go over our head in one ear and out the other until they start to kind of stick to something. And that's still the case even for me. There's things I won't, I won't understand that I'm reading right now or hearing right now, and I won't understand that for 20 years. That's just the nature of life. No matter what, even if you return to something that you thought you had totally grasped, you come back later, see it with new eyes, and you get something else out of it. So I hope that that's the case for you guys with the interverse. Every time you come back around, that there is more that is uh, supporting your worldview uh, as, you know, and your self view as the uh, unlimited, super generative powers that you are contain, express and wield. Thanks for being here. All glory to the supreme source and singularity of life, which is in you and in everywhere. All right. With that, I'm out. Much love. Catch you on the next one. Oh.